This video is brought to you by my lovely patrons Thomas Johnson, James Rapp, Mike Ran, Kevin Strauss, Rudbot, Tom Smarty, Miriam H, Edward Pierre, Ben Hancock, newcomer Jessica Handley, and special thanks to ARW and John Mezzo for their contributions to today's video. For as little as 3 Australian dollars a month, you can get your name shouted out at the start of every Sawmon video as well as access to bonus behind the scenes content, link in the description below. Hey guys, so for the next few videos in this series, I'll be going through our nation's first 20 Prime Ministers, in blocks of four, as I ready myself to cover the election gone by, as well as put our 30th Prime Minister Scott Morrison in the spotlight. So without further ado, let's look back on our nation's first, second, third and fourth Prime Minister, starting with none other than... While a lot of nations hold their first leader in high regards, I don't feel like Edmund Biden quite gets the same level of praise. This is seen in the fact that more Australians know who George Washington is over Edmund Barton, a leader from a completely different country. So why is Barton so forgotten? In my opinion, it's because he really didn't do much as Prime Minister. While Barton was a pivotal figure in the Federation movement, he only spent less than three years as Prime Minister. While he did pass some major legislation such as nationwide women's suffrage along with the establishment of the Australian Defence Force and public sector, it's hard to describe these things as Barton's own policy. We also have to address the fact that his government introduced the White Australia policy, one of the worst policies in Australian history. To sum up, I don't view Barton in very high regard, and I feel like his successor was the Prime Minister who really got stuff done. Over on Patreon, ARW says, M. Barr was appointed the inaugural Prime Minister largely for symbolic reasons of him hailing from the so-called Mother Colony of New South Wales, and for being the most prominent campaigner for Federation and from that state following the death of the father of Federation, Sir Henry Parks. He was able to continue in government following the election of March 1901, but only with Labour supporting his protectionists in the form of a minority government. Much of Barton's prime ministership involves setting up the institutional framework of the federal government. Among the first statutes passed were Immigration Act that formed the basis of the infamous White Australia policy. When the High Court of Australia was created in 1903, Barton was appointed an inaugural justice and thus left federal politics completely after just two years. Barton's period of prime ministership was too is too brief to appraise as, as an is too brief to appraise as a successful one, particularly as much of it was consumed with administrative tasks that did not make for exciting history telling. His biggest achievement was probably overseeing a functional government in the first place, given he was a minority government, and his cabinet was largely made up of senior politicians from various colonies who were active in the Federation movement and likely had big egos on their parochial perspectives to manage. We also have John Mezzo who says, While our early political leaders like Barton obviously deserve praise for their work in shaping the constitution and leading the way for federation, it's hard to overlook the introduction of the White Australia policy as it's one of the first pieces of legislation introduced. We've even deported the Pacific Island workers in the 1900s who were brought here ex for extensively slave labour under White Australia, something even American and other countries didn't do after it ended slavery. In addition, the constant abhorrent politics towards indigenous Australians should be remembered. To me, Deakin was our first real Prime Minister, not least of which was due to the fact that he stuck around for seven years and actually got stuff done. While his first sitting at the top job ended in failure with the Labour Party assuming temporary control, Deakin did come back to govern in 1905 and would govern for the next three years. It was in this time that Deakin was at his most successful as he would establish the Royal Australian Navy as well as form a standalone currency. However, after the election of 1906, Deakin's position would be weakened once again by a poor performance in that year's election. This would eventually result in Labour assuming control once again. In response, Deakin would merge his protectionist party with the Free Trade Party to form the first Liberal Party. While this party would be successful in getting Deakin back into power, it would not last very long, and the party would be wiped out in the 1910 election. While Deakin did lead the protectionist party into its eventual oblivion, a lot of that was due to the changing nature of politics and not so much his own doing. In my opinion, he set the standard for Prime Ministers to follow, and on a side note, he also kind of looks like my uncle. Meanwhile over on Patreon, ARW says, Alfred Deakin was undoubtedly the dominant figure of the first decade of Federation, and was largely responsible for defining the institutional framework of the federal government across his three terms as Prime Minister. He was a foremost advocate of the protectionist economic policies in the federal parliament, and put in place the tariffs and interventionist approach on economic management that would characterise the Australian economy for decades to come. He was also central to the development of the two-party system when he finalised the fusion of his protectionists with the former Free Trade Party in 1909 to form what is now respectively termed the Commonwealth slash Deaconite Liberal Party. 
This party was only a mirage of convenience between the rival factions and would be defeated in the 1910 election by a resurgent Labour Party, but it did set in stone the development of the modern two-party system that is largely taken for granted today. And while it's not the same organisation as today's Liberal Party, Sir Robert Menzies did name the party the Liberals in 1944, partly to draw a link to Deakin's party, with Sir Robert himself claiming that Deakin was the most important Prime Minister of those who had served before him. There's not much to say about Watson and Reid, as they both weren't really Prime Ministers very long. Much like how I view Deakin as the first true Prime Minister, I tend to view Andrew Fisher as the first true Labour leader instead of Watson. Despite being the youngest Prime Minister at 35, Watson only got six pieces of legislation passed, most of which were just supply bills. In contrast to Watson, Reid did even less as Prime Minister, and as a result he is one of the most forgotten Prime Ministers in Australian history. Although, as an interesting bit of trivia, Reid died in 1918, making him the first Prime Minister to pass away, He'd be followed by Deakin in 1919 and Barton in 1920. Watson, meanwhile, would live all the way into World War II, where he would pass away in 1941. Going over to Patreon, ARW says, Chris Watson is historically important as the first leader of any national government to represent the Social Democratic Party such as Labour, which had some philosophical basis in socialism. Watson only became Prime Minister in 1904 due to Deakin resigning over amendments to an arbitration legislation. While he did form government, it caused a brief shock to the political and business establishment they never thought they'd find themselves living under a socialist government so soon. These fears were put to rest in just four months when Watson was forced to resign over further amendments to the same arbitration bill that saw him become PM in the first place. His government did not pass any legislation, so his record as Prime Minister in itself is not remarkable. Though his consolatory approach to Labour leadership, particularly his willingness to support the protectionist legislation program, did set an important precedent for future Labour leaders. And on George Reid they say, George Reid, who was opposition leader for most of the first decade post-Federation, became Prime Minister after the aforementioned downfall of Chris Watson in 1904 with the support of Deakin's protectionists. His government did pass the arbitration bills that set up the Australian system of compulsory arbitration of labour disputes, but fell in mid-1905 when Deakin withdrew further support to become PM for a second time. Like Watson, Reid was not in power long enough to leave a significant mark in the government, and is probably more noteworthy for his contribution in opposition. As a prominent of free trade, he ultimately lost the issue to Deakin's advocacy of protection, though the embracement of free trade policy since the 1980s have arguably vindicated his position in retrospect. Reid's most notable contribution was that it was he who initiated the movement towards the development of the two-party system, when in 1906 he renamed the Free Trade Party to the Anti-Socialist Party in an attempt to redefine the Australian political system on Labour-Non-Labour -Labor lines. This was achieved when Deakin fused his party with the Anti-Socialists in 1909, though Reid was a long-time opponent of Deakin's and left politics altogether so that he would not have to be a party to this merger. As for some more general takes, we have Not the Prime Minister who says, While I don't have a lot to say about our early Prime Ministers, I do think they are often overlooked and are pretty underrated. I commend their efforts in building up our nation since the start of Federation, especially since most Prime Ministers were pretty young when they came to office. Chris Watson is still the youngest Prime Minister in Australian Parliament to date, only being in his late 30s when he assumed office. Generally, I think our first four Prime Ministers are often overshadowed by later ones like Whitlam, Hawke, Keating and Howard, but I think they still play an important role into leading our country since the Declaring Federation in 1901. I know there's not much to go on as these figures all died long before most of us were born, but I want to thank you for your comments. Carrying on with this series, next time we'll be covering Andrew Fisher, Joseph Cook, Billy Hughes and Stanley Bruce, so leave your comments on these Prime Ministers if you want to see them featured in my next video, and also feel free to join me on Patreon if you want to guarantee your comments being read out in the next video. Until then, I'll see you later.